and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for April 2024 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is a show where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks, and then we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. In this episode, we're chatting about the brand new star that will be appearing in our sky in the next few months as it undergoes a nova, and the update to the image of the Milky Way's supermassive black hole, turning it from a donut into a croissant. <laughs> There's chapter markers down here if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story, plus any scientific research papers I mentioned are all going to be linked in the video description free to read. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. First of all, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that sent me their eclipse images. They were all fantastic, from the more professional looking ones to the ones that were just took on your phones to the blurry ones that were born out of sheer excitement and disbelief that you were actually getting to witness this event. I loved every single one of them. Now, a lot of you have been asking what you should do with your eclipse glasses now that the eclipse is over, because the next total eclipse to cross the lower 48 of the US isn't until 24. Well, there's been a couple of programs set up to redistribute eclipse glasses to people living all around the world who happen to be in the path of totality for the next few eclipses. So Astronomers Without Borders, for example, have partnered with a few stores, in particular Warby Parker on a national level, to collect glasses and then donate them to people around the world to enjoy future eclipses. There's a list on their website of partnering stores where you can just drop them off. Also, Eclipse Glasses USA also have a donation program where you can post off your eclipse glasses to them and they'll be donated to people in South America where there's going to be an annular solar eclipse later this year in October. But enough about the eclipse, let's chat about what you can see in the night sky in the next couple of weeks. Because you might hear a few people talking about the Lyrids meteor shower, that this year is peaking on the night of the 21st of April going into the morning of the 22nd of April. But to be honest, I wouldn't make special plans to try and see this one. The Lyrids meteor shower is an average meteor shower, you know, you tend to get around about 10 to 15 meteors per hour. So shooting stars like streaking across the sky caused by just tiny lumps of space rock burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. So what, 10 to 15 meteors an hour? That's one every four to six minutes or so. Plus this year on the night of the meteor shower peaks, the moon will also be very close to full. So that'll make the sky really bright, meaning it'll wash out, you know, the faintest meteors leaving you only with the brightest ones, meaning you'll see even less. Plus, if you add light pollution into the mix there as well, the number of meteors that you're going to see is just going to keep dropping. If I were you, I would instead wait for the Eta Aquarids meteor shower, which peaks this year in the early morning of the 7th of May, when the moon is very close to its new moon phase. So the sky will be dark and the Eta Aquarids meteor shower gives you roughly like 50 meteors per hour. So that's almost one a minute. Plus the little lumps of space rock that cause this meteor shower are all left over from the famous Halley's Comet, which is a quite a fun bit of trivia. The further south you are though, the better the show will be for this one because the radiance of the place in the sky that all of the meteors appear to be coming from will be higher in the sky in the southern hemisphere. Whereas for those of us further north, it'll be close to the horizon, so we'll lose half of them as they streak below the horizon. If you're in the north, though, look towards the southeast, and you should see the meteors streaking upwards from there. If you're in the southern hemisphere, just look directly up. And remember, meteor spotting really is just a bit of a waiting game, so get comfy, get yourself a chair, or even just lie down on a blanket. I find that, you know, doesn't hurt my neck as much as uh, sort of looking back and upwards trying to spot these. You should be able to see them with the naked eye. You don't need any sort of special equipment for them, no telescopes, no binoculars, or anything like that. You just have to keep your eyes peeled because they really are like just a, a blink and a miss it sort of thing with how quickly they streak across the sky. And now the best time to spot these is going to be before dawn on the 7th of May, which I know is not everybody's ideal time to actually go stargazing. So if you are stargazing, maybe like the, the week before or the week after the 7th of May, so perhaps on the bank holiday weekend here in the UK, maybe you've traveled somewhere for the weekend, you know, and, and got darker skies. If you do spot a meteor anytime in that period, most likely it comes from the Eta Aquarius shower. In these last few weeks of April though, try to spot Jupiter in the west just after sunset because it'll soon get too close to the sun from our perspective and we won't be able to see it again until it sweeps around the other side of the sun and becomes visible in the morning sky by July. It will be getting closer to the horizon as April chugs along though, making it more difficult to spot against the afterglow of the sunset. Plus, the further you are from the equator at this time of year, the more difficult it's going to be for you to spot Jupiter. 
Jupiter, especially as the month goes on, just because of the angle of the solar system to the horizon at this time of year. But those of you who saw the total solar eclipse might even have noticed Jupiter in the sky when it went dark during totality, because it is fairly close to the sun right now. Jupiter was the one just above the sun, hence why it's visible just after sunset right now. And Venus was the one that everybody saw below the sun quite close to it. It's so close that we can't see Venus in the night sky at the minute, and it won't actually be visible again until August. But don't worry, because Mars and Saturn are still visible at the minute in the early morning sky before sunrise in the east. Again, due to the angle of the solar system to the horizon, this is easier to see the closer to the equator you are as they'll rise higher in the sky before the sun comes up. And if you manage to spot them a couple of times in the next few weeks, you might notice how they're slowly moving apart from each other as well, as they both move along their orbits and Earth moves along its orbit as well. Plus, on the 4th of May, the crescent moon, aka my favourite moon phase, the toenail moon, joins the party and sits smack bang in the middle of the two planets. Mars is the lower one and will look slightly reddish in colour, whereas Saturn is more yellowish and will be above the moon. I don't think I'm going to have a clear enough eastern horizon to spot this one though, because it's going to be quite low down. So if you do manage to spot it and get up early enough, tag me in any pictures you take over on social media, because I'd always love to see them. All right, before we chat about what's been happening in space news, I just want to chat a little bit about our mental health. Because I don't know about you, but I talk to my family about everything. It helps me process all my thoughts and emotions, and it just makes me feel better. But then something happened last year where I didn't want to talk to my family about it because I didn't want to burden them with the worry and the stress of it all. But then that meant that I didn't really process what was going on properly at all. But I found that talking about it in therapy really helped me. And that's what BetterHelp offers. This is a paid partnership with them. They make connecting with a therapist so easy and convenient, especially for those of us with busy lives. The platform is online and your therapy is done remotely, so you can do it from the safe space of your own home. By filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can connect you with a credentialed therapist in under 48 hours in most cases. But if it turns out you don't fit with that therapist, then you can easily switch to another free of charge. In therapy, I was able to voice things that I needed to voice without like fear of burdening somebody that I love. So if this sounds at all familiar to you, try giving BetterHelp a go and just see if it helps. Look, there's a link in the video description to betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can choose Dr. Becky at sign up, which if you click, not only supports this channel, but also gets you 10% off your first month's therapy with BetterHelp. So thanks again to BetterHelp. And now let's chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. <laughs> So let's start with a news story that could have been in the previous night sky section, and that's the appearance of a brand new star in our sky as the star T Corona Borealis is set to go nova in the next couple of months, like by September 2024. Now, I've seen a lot of coverage of this online and in the media, and although it is very cool, I just want to rein in people's expectations a little bit. So first I'm going to chat about like what is actually happening and then we'll chat about the science of why it's happening. So in this area of sky, in the constellation of Corona Borealis, which translates as Northern Crown, this U-shape apparently looked like a crown to the Greeks, there's a star right here that normally you can't see with your naked eye. It's even fainter than Neptune. But we reckon that sometime between April and September 2024, this star will go nova. Have essentially a little mini explosion that will make it bright enough to even be able to see it from city suburbs where there's a lot of light pollution. But we're not talking like so bright that you can see it during the day like you'd expect from like a supernova. We're talking about as bright as the stars in the W constellation Cassiopeia. It will just look like a new average looking star has appeared in the night sky. But here's the thing, if you're not familiar with what that part of the sky looks like near Corona Borealis, you're not really going to notice if one more star just appears in the sky. You're going to be looking up and going, yeah, 
stars what what's the difference so if you want to be ready for this happening then i'm afraid you've got some astronomy homework to do in getting familiar with this part of the sky and this constellation should be visible from wherever you are in the world and for those of us in the northern hemisphere i've got a little bit of a trick for how you can find it first of all you find the plow constellation or the big dipper whatever you might call it one of those famous constellations in the northern sky right and you follow the handle of the plow, right? The pan handle across until you hit the U shape of Corona Borealis. If you hit the square of Hercules, you've gone too far. It will be roughly in the Southeast, but you can also just download a star chart app on your phone and find it that way. While you're there, you might as well snap a picture of the night sky with your phone in that area so that you can help sort of like commit what it looks like to memory so that when the Nova happens, you can play a game of spot the difference. But what actually is a nova and how do we know that it's going to happen in the next couple of months? Well, nova are caused by white dwarf stars. These are dead stars, the cores of stars like the sun that have already lived their normal lives and then the cores have been left behind. These dead stars are really dense. So size-wise, they're only about like the diameter of the Earth, but they contain the same amount of mass as the sun, which means that if they're in orbit around another star, they're in a binary system, a pair of stars. Then they start to pull material off the other star, which then rains down onto the surface of the white dwarf and gets heated up. As more and more material builds up, it gets hotter and hotter until eventually you reach a temperature where you can ignite nuclear fusion and get hydrogen to fuse together to make helium and lots of other heavier elements. And what you get is a runaway reaction like a nuclear bomb and all that material ignites and is thrown off the star. That comes as a huge burst of brightness, which we then see as looking like a brand new star in the night sky to our eyes. And then it fades after a few weeks or months or so. Now, Nova aren't that rare. There's maybe, say, 10 or so a year that happen in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Then there are some stars that are a rare class of Nova, and these are called recurrent nova, where we've seen them do this a couple of times over the past centuries, and we only know of 10 recurrent nova ever. Now this star T Corona Borealis is the most special of the recurrent nova because it gets the brightest when it does go nova, which means we can see it in the night sky with just our eyes. Now we observed it back in 1866 and then again in 1946. So it seems to be reaching that buildup of material when it gets hot enough to ignite fusion every 80 years or so, which means we are now due a nova. And last year, astronomers noticed that it was behaving exactly like it was back in 1946, where it actually first dimmed in brightness before it went nova. Now we're not entirely sure what causes this like pre-nova dimming. It could be that as the material builds up on the surface of this white dwarf star that it builds this sort of outer crusty dusty layer of like heavier elements essentially that's what I mean by dust that then cause the star to dim slightly because it blocks a lot of the light but we still don't really know it's one of the big unanswered questions about this nova but since it's behaving the same as in 1946 a similar nova is now expected sometime between April and September when it'll go from a magnitude 10 star to around about a magnitude of 2.5 just to give you some context that means it'll go from faint to the Neptune to just about making it into the list of the top 100 brightest stars in the night sky. So it won't be super obvious, but if you do your homework, then you will be able to spot the difference and sort of enjoy that this event is happening. Obviously, the people who are going to get most excited are the astrophysicists who actually study Nova, because what's going to happen as soon as it goes off, every single ground-based and space-based telescope is just going to turn its attention to this star in the hope of us learning more about why and how these Nova happen. There's even a JWST proposal that's been accepted for if, when the Nova happens to make sure there's a plan in place and we can get the data we need. And we're set to learn so much more than we did with the observations that were made back in 1946 because we can now observe this across the entire electron 
electromagnetic spectrum, you know, all these different wavelengths of light encode different information. So not only will we be able to see it with visible light, but also in infrared with JWST or in X-ray with the Chandra telescope, which, you know, we didn't have last time because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs in infrared and in X-rays. And so you have to launch space telescopes to be able to see this. You know, the first X-ray space telescope wasn't launched until the 1970s. So lots of open questions about T. Corona Borealis and its nova, including why this one reoccurs and others don't, whether the white dwarf star in this system is reaching its maximum allowed mass and whether it'll go full on supernova anytime soon, and also the ratio of different elements that are produced in the nova and thrown off the star, you know, because that will tell us, you know, how much of the hydrogen was actually converted to these heavier elements in that runaway fusion process in the nova, because we also think a lot of like carbon, nitrogen and oxygen are produced in Nova, you know, elements that then go into making life and rocky planets. So Nova could be a really important phenomena for the like emergence of life in the universe. Now, if you want a real deep dive on this, I've linked a seminar in the video description down below by Dr. Brad Schaefer from Louisiana State University, who talks through the history of observations of TCRB and the science done already, plus how you can also help to monitor TRCB from your own home so we can catch the Nova in the act. So that we can more quickly mobilize all the telescopes in the world to point at this star so that we actually catch the nova when it happens. And one of those telescopes will be the Chandra X-ray telescope. And if you remember from last month's Night Sky News, I shared the news that NASA has proposed cutting Chandra's budget in its 2025 budget request to Congress, meaning that a phasing out of the telescope is going to start, a decision that has baffled me and my colleagues. It is one of the four great observatories that were launched by NASA back in 1990. Hubble in visible light, Compton in gamma ray, Spitzer in infrared light, and Chandra in x-ray, together which covered nearly all of the electromagnetic spectrum of light. Now it's over 30 years later now and all of those telescopes have aged and so have either been replaced or are due to be replaced. So Compton was replaced with Fermi, Spitzer was replaced with JWST, and Hubble is set to eventually be replaced by the Roman telescope which is launching in 2027. But there's no plan to replace Chandra, and with this budget cut, it's going to be phased out before a plan can even be put together, never mind a new telescope launched to replace it. What's more is that Chandra is working absolutely fine even after 30 years, still detecting some of the most energetic events in our universe, from nova to black holes to the hot gas that surrounds galaxies. Look, Chandra needs less money to run than either of JWST or the Hubble Space Telescope. In terms of budget, it's about the same cost as an F-16. So there's now a campaign to save Chandra. I'm going to link the website down below with all the details, but essentially they're asking for as many people as possible to contact Congress through your representative or senator. The most impactful way you can do this is by phone, or you can also email them as well. I'm not a US resident, so I can't do this. I cannot make an impact. I cannot help to save Chandra. But if you are a US resident, then you can help save Chandra and make sure that we have this telescope for another 10 years at least so it can continue working alongside JWST and Hubble and Roman when it launches so that we can investigate some of the highest energy processes in our universe. So it's a little bit of a sad story. So let's have some fun now and look at some of the April Fool's research papers that were published on the 1st of April. This has become a little bit of a tradition now in astrophysics to just, you know, publish a little like tongue in cheek research paper on the 1st and just have a little bit of fun with it. So let's go through them and have a look at some of the best ones. A lot of them obviously were about the total solar eclipse on the 8th of April, including this one, which looked into which animal has seen the most total solar eclipses on Earth, considering population size and how long it's been around for. And then the authors present an argument that it's the Atlantic horseshoe crab that's seen the most. Then there was this one which was particularly sarcastic on multi-messenger astrology, so predictions for human lives, not just from our visible light observations of the universe, but also gamma rays and neutrinos and even gravitational waves. Then again, a more tongue-in-cheek one here, looking at whether you could solve the Hubble tension or crisis in cosmology 
property if you change the value of pi. Pi is a set value, right? It's the ratio of a circle's diameter to its circumference. So it's not something that changes. So this one was particularly sarcastically funny, really poking fun like at all the new physics ideas that have been raised to solve the Hubble tension that I talked about in last week's video that allow physical constants to vary to make everything fit the models. So here they find a new value of pi of 3.206 and state that makes all of our cosmology values agree now. But my favorite of these April Fool's research papers by far was this one by Wilkins, Newman and Roper, which proposed the food framework or redshift epochs for everybody, which provided a consistent way to refer to different epochs in the universe's history, defining them in terms of their levels of redshift or referring to the different epochs, like the time of day, like we have done traditionally in the past, like cosmic dawn is like the early days of the universe. Cosmic noon is when there was like the peak of stars forming in the universe. But there's no real like agreed on definition. So they've provided some here and set them. But they argue that given like the human experience, we should refer to the universe's epochs in terms of meal times of the day. And so refer to them as everything from breakfast to so what about second breakfast? Of course not forgetting about second breakfast or... Elevensies, luncheon, afternoon tea, dinner, supper. He knows about them, doesn't he? On it. But the best bit of this whole paper, and I'm sure only my fellow northerners will appreciate this as much as I did. They also provided a parallel scheme for us northerners who call lunch dinner, and our dinner we call our tea. And of course, while the authors recognise that this parallel scheme may only deepen confusion here, they also invite anyone to produce their own parallel schemes for mealtimes within their own culture. So you know that that's what the comment section of this video has got to be for now, and I'll send the best ones to the authors of this paper. Next up this month, we saw the release of a new image from the Event Horizon collaboration of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, known as Sagittarius A-star. This time with information added about the polarization of the light so that we can see the magnetic field around the black hole, which I always joke takes these images from looking like donuts to croissants. So if you remember the Event Horizon Telescope released the first ever image of a black hole back in 2019 of the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy Messier 87, which at the time I made a video on explaining. And then in 2021, we got the polarized light image of M87's black hole, which I covered in a night sky news at the time. We then got the first image of the Milky Way supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A-star, in 2022, which again, I made a video explaining specifically why it was different to M87's black hole image. And now, two years later, at the end of March 2024, they released this polarized light image for Sagittarius A-star, along with two new research papers to describe it. And so here we are again in another Night Sky News video. So what is actually going on in this image? Well, we have to remember that what we're seeing here in this region that is sort of colored orange is that we're seeing the glow from the material that is spiraling around the supermassive black hole before it's got to the event horizon, that point of no return. Inside the event horizon is the region of the image that is black that we're no longer receiving any light from. And because of the huge gravity of the supermassive black hole, the material that's spiraling around it is accelerated to huge speeds. It's superheated so that it glows so that we can see it, but it also means it has a huge amount of energy as well energy that's enough to actually take the electrons that are bound on their orbits around the center of the atom and free them from those orbits. So that you have what's known as a plasma, where you've got free floating, negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons or other heavier atom nuclei just swirling around that black hole. So you've got moving charged particles. That's what gives you a magnetic Field. Now, light is an electromagnetic wave, which means it has a magnetic component to it. And so when that material glows and emits light, those magnetic components get aligned along the magnetic field, giving the light a preferred orientation or what's known as polarization of the light. So what the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration have done is record the orientation, the polarization of the light, and then from that reconstructed what the magnetic field looks like. So let's be very clear here about what we're seeing in this 
image. It's the original radio light image that was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope and released back in 2022, but overlaid on top of it is this data visualization of the magnetic field that comes from the polarization. This might become a little bit clearer with this image from one of the research papers released alongside the image this month, where they show the polarization information in the top panel over plotted on like a black and white intensity of the radio light received in the background. And then in the bottom image show this overlay on that color intensity image we're all used to having converted that polarization information into the magnetic field line information. So yes, they've turned a donut into a croissant, but you could also learn a lot of science here too. First of all, it looks very similar to the polarization image for Messier 87 supermassive black hole, which is really intriguing because Messier 87 supermassive black hole is over a thousand times more massive than the Milky Way's supermassive black hole. So that suggests that, you know, that whatever the size or the mass of the black hole, the magnetic field is still going to act the same, which then has these huge implications for, you know, how and how fast supermassive black holes might even grow as well. Because yes, the magnetic field can first of all act as like a funnel to, you know, sort of funnel charged particles down so that it can go beyond the event horizon and the black hole can use it to, to grow in mass. But also we think that magnetic fields are involved in the launching of jets from regions around the black hole and the, the pressure builds up because there's too much material coming in. It sort of regulates the growth. And we've always wondered whether this process was like reliant on the mass or the size of the black hole, because we do tend to see jets more often than not around more massive black holes. But this result suggests that it should be the same, no matter the mass or the size or even the environment that the black hole is in. The second research paper that was released dives into everything else new that we've learned from this polarization image, including fitting models of Sagittarius A star's spin direction and spin rate from this polarization data as well. That's all linked below if you want more of a deep dive on this. Hey everyone, Becky from the future here. So I know that I promised to put in the results about the dark energy spectroscopic instrument survey that looked at how the expansion rate of the universe has changed over time. I promised that in last week's video. This video is already 30 minutes long, so we're going to just move that into a video of its own next week because there's just so much to talk about there. So look out for that one. In the meantime, I'm going to get back to this collaboration meeting that I'm at. We're looking at JD Boy's tea data. I'm writing a few papers. All right, that's it for Night Sky News for this month. As always, if you see any space news stories that you'd like me to explain in a future Night Sky News episode, or if you want to share some images of the night sky that you've taken, tag me over on social media. But until next time, everybody. Happy stargazing. Oh, oh, I tried to like scroll on my laptop with my toes and it didn't work. <laughs> Let's go try again. No, stop clicking. I just want to scroll. No, ah, what am I trying to say? <laughs> That's happening later this year in October, 2025. Nope, 2024, later this year in October, 2025. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Now you might hear a couple of people chalking, chalking? A meteor on that night, it most likely is from the Delta Aquarians. Delta Aquarians? Eta Aquarians. Ooh, so close to the end. Plus the further you were Present Moon, aka my favorite toenail. No, not my favorite toenail. This is what I was trying to avoid saying before. So just, you know, download a smart chart app. A smart chart app? A star chart app. These dead stars are really one hair is just in the way and I can't decide where it wants to go to my haircut. <laughs> Hello? Sorry, that was the BBC asking for an interview, but I said no. And also, I can't remember what the next question was. Oh, that was it, the ratio. This, I've linked to seminar, 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 I've linked to seminar. I'm from New Zealand all of a sudden. <laughs> hey y'all, Becky from the future here. Did I say y'all? If you're a US president, if you're a US president, then you can help. I'm talking to you now, Joe Biden. <laughs> the magnetic field will always act, act. It will always act the same. But what about elevensies, luncheon, afternoon tea, dinner, supper? He knows about those, doesn't he? Boom. I don't think he knows about second breakfast, Pip.